Okay, we're starting to get some people back from our breakout. We should have every, everybody back here shortly. Can everybody see my screen that I'm sharing? Okay, we're starting to get some people back from our breakout. We should have every, everybody back. I'll breakout. get back to you. Can everybody All see right, my that's screen odd. That sharing? Getting a little get feedback here. I'll get back to you. I don't know how I'm going to fix that. Getting a little feedback here. I get back to you. I may have to mute everybody here. I may have to mute everybody here. And I am live with Facebook, so it could be uh, Facebook messing with me here. Let's see if I can get out of this. And I am live with Facebook, so it could be uh, Facebook messing with me here. Let's see if I can get out of this. And I am live with Facebook, so it could be Facebook. All right. Hopefully I'm still live. All right, so welcome everybody to Denver Association of Assisted Living Residences. We are ready to start our program. I hope you had a good time with the networking portion of that. Um, next, we are going to go into uh, our sponsors. I want to talk a little bit about our website. If you are in the Colorado area, you would want to go to our website, the daalr.com. That stands for the Denver Association of Assisted Living Residences. On this page or this site, one of the key places to go is under the key links here. If you are going to operate in assisted living here in Colorado, you need to understand and learn all of these rules. We have them highlighted right here. It's the very first link on the page. These are all of the regulations that you need to know, like the back of your hand here in Colorado. Uh, also, we have our website. So we encourage everybody to join our website. It's called Denver ALR. And this is a great place for networking, just kind of what we did. Um, if you, uh, we've gotten, um, we've seen people get rid of stair, uh, chair lifts here. Uh, buy things, uh, find employees, and make announcements. So this is a, a good place for you to network. And of course, we have our meetup page. Uh, please join our meetup page. This is where a lot of our announcements will come from. And uh, so next, um, we have the sponsors. And these are our current sponsors right now. We have the RAL National Association, of which we are a Colorado chapter of. And um, I think I need to actually go in and fix this slide because right now you have a free membership with them if you are part of our group. And it's the ralna.com is the uh, website. Can everybody see that or are you seeing this little screen sharing uh, thing down here? Well, it's, I'm not sure I'll get rid of that. Um, after that, we have Anderson, Legal Business and Tax Advisors at AndersonAdvisors.com. If you are setting up your business, these guys really know how to structure your business so that you are protected. You know, it's a lot about asset protection. They're also uh, great tax advisors. I actually have these guys under contract right now setting up a solo 401k for myself. So they do that as well. Um, next, we have the RAL Academy. If you're new to this industry, and learning about residential assisted living, this is definitely the place to go. They have great education there, lots and lots of resources. Um, they're the ones that actually founded that national association we just talked about a few minutes ago. So go to the, we have a link here on our website to REL Academy, and that will take you right to their site. It's relacademy.com if you wanna bypass our website though. Um, Next, if you have an assisted living and you need to market it, 
uh, assisted living marketing. We'll create websites and help you with that marketing. Uh, Peter Brissett, who is the owner and operator and his smiling face is right here. He's the one that built our website for the Denver Association of Assisted Living Residences. I think he also did uh, the Cala website. And um, he's a great guy, really knows his stuff. We have him working on another business that we have. Um, he's been extremely responsive. I highly recommend using Peter and assisted living marketing. Colorado's assisted living lawyers, uh, they're not only just Colorado's lawyers, they're also nationwide, Pinkowski Law. If you have questions or if you're dealing with zoning issues or HOAs, these are the people that you want to talk to. They understand the fair housing laws. They can guide you through dealing with uh, an HOA that's being a thorn in your side. I've seen them go to battle against these guys. They really know what they're doing. Um, if you're looking to increase the number of beds, uh, they can help you figure out how you can do that by dealing with zoning, the city, HOAs. So look up PinkowskiLaw.com. That's Michelle and there's Brian. They've been part of our group for many years. Um, they're wonderful people. They really know their stuff and they love assisted living. Uh, next is uh, my group, uh, Grand Avenue Business Brokers at A Better Way Realty and A Better Way Realty Group. And um, I am a business broker. I can help you buy and sell assisted living. At A Better Way Realty, we have several real estate investments and groups and partnerships. And we do lease options for assisted living where we will come in and buy the properties and lease them out to operators and help you grow your business. I've got a few clients on the call or on our meeting here tonight. Um, our website for the lease options is ralleaseoptions.com. While we're talking about lease options, I want to proudly announce that we are closing on Monday the 3rd on this 58 unit independent living and assisted living property for one of our best clients. This is our biggest deal that we've done in assisted living yet. It is eight and a half million dollars. And it's got, uh, it, it's got great potential. The operators that we're putting into this have done a phenomenal job so far. They're gonna kill it with this deal. So I wanted to announce that. And while we're talking about bigger deals, I also have an assisted living. It's a set of four facilities that's available in Grand Junction, Colorado. There's 43 beds total. And we're asking 3.1 million for that. So next um, news from Cala, we've got Tammy Muir here. And Tammy, would you like to say a few words about what's going on with Cala? Sure, thanks, Fern. Um, welcome everybody. Um, the chat rooms were exciting. Interesting that all the chat rooms, there was only one person from Colorado that I talked to today. Everybody was from out of state and that was really exciting. Um, so Ralna has certainly, or the Denver ALR group has certainly grown. Um, Colorado Assisted Living um, is an organization representing small assisted living operators. Um, we really try to um, focus on the people that own 19 beds or less. Um, although we have um, all sizes as members and many um, associate members as well from uh, related entities. Um, updates from Cala really have um, been, um, Right now we're um, working with the legislature on sponsoring a bill to try to help um, release some of the onerous regulations that affect small industry. And we are, um, we're getting there um, to the point where we can talk about it more pretty soon. Um, we're like on the, the second revision of the revision. So um, be uh, in tune for that and look for that com coming on our website. Um, we are, um, I don't know if any of you have attended the Colorado Assisted Living Conference, but we had a, had a spring conference. It's in two parts. Um, last week um, on Friday was our first one and we had discussions on COVID with the health department and we're gonna have phase two, I think with the panel um, with, the, with part two of that um, workshop tomorrow. <laughs> Um, talking about culture change, there was a discussion on person-centered care plans, which I um, um, think was um, really well done. And then we had also a presentation on technology and activities, which was um, very helpful for a lot of people, especially in the COVID day and age. Um, tomorrow's um, 
uh, presentation is going to be a lot from CDPHE and then discussing culture change in the assisted living um, um, residences and um, talking about survey tracking. What are the surveyors looking for when they come into our facilities? And as Vern said, those regulations that are posted, um, you need to know those in your sleep, I think, mostly. Um, and then another discussion on cultivating resiliency. So tomorrow is going to be a really great conference. Um, it's from 12 to 5. And for those of you who haven't registered, you can still register online at calaonline.org. And um, the fee is pretty nominal. And members, um, it's a great time to become a member. Uh, membership is um, significantly reduced. And um, with that membership, you get free recordings to all of the things that have been happening. Um, another thing we've been doing um, is working on the Medicaid reimbursement, and that has also been a um, long draining process, but we're making some headway. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just wanted to let you know a little bit about what we're doing. Janet, do you have anything else to add? You're on mute, dear. Yeah, unmute. mute. Um, no, I think you did great. There's about 11 of us on the board. We try to welcome new people. We're really trying to change the face of Cala to be um, very much in, including other small businesses so that we can help you guys get off uh, running to a good start and, and know the regulations. And if you're struggling, you have someone to reach out to because we're very supportive of all assisted living homes. And, and I think with um, those of you who are from out of state, um, we've also been doing a lot of, um, in our own research for regulation change in Colorado, we've been working on um, investigating regulations in other states. And, and um, I know the Pinkowskis, who Vern also mentioned, um, have had a lot of exposure to different regulations. So um, we might be able to leap in to help you. So excited Great. for this evening's talk. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, be sure to put the uh, link to the uh, conference into the chat screen. OK, I will. All right. And again, I want to remind everybody here to put your contact information into the chat screen at the end of the night where you put your information in. You see a little button, three little dots on it. You click on that and you can save that chat uh, as a text file. And then you have the contact information for everybody that you've spoken with. So next, I want to introduce uh, Mr. C.J. Thompson. Um, CJ and I have not met till tonight, but we have spoken several times on the phone. I've sent several deals to him for his review. I have uh, worked with his associate, uh, Mackie Hayes, uh, Mackie Hughes, and uh, Live Oak Bank. I met at the national conference two, three years ago, I think it was. It's been a while. They've been very involved in assisted living, and they are probably the most assisted living friendly bank that I've run across. I try to send all of my clients to them and I want to introduce CJ Thompson. Let's give CJ a round of applause. Vern, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, first, uh, thank you for putting all this together. Um, happy to be here and hopefully um, I'll be able to, to provide some information that's helpful to everyone. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here as I get into the presentation. Um, bear with me one minute. All right. Can y'all all see that now? Oops. Any thumbs up? Looks good. Looks good. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, I'll go right into this. Um, I know we're, we're might be a little short on time. Hopefully, try to leave some time for uh, for questions at the end. We should um, be good, CJ. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, so as Vern mentioned, um, I'm with Live Oak Bank. Uh, been with Live Oak for about nine years now, um, and we we're a very unique bank in that we are kind of siloed into. Um, what we call different verticals. Uh, we started out lending only to veterinarians, um, but have slowly expanded are now in 30 different industries in all. Um, and obviously we have a team um, that focuses in the senior care space. Um, and that's where I am today. And that's, again, my team, there's about five of us in all. Um, Vern alluded to, to working with Mackie as well. He's a member of that team. And we all um, have a, a laser-like focus on the senior care space. Um, 
And interesting with Live Oak, despite being focused in only a handful of industries that the SBA works with, um, we are the number one lender in the country by dollar volume. Um, that's an SBA lender. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. So what is kind of the, the state of the industry in terms of um, assisted living facilities today, especially coming off last year with COVID? Obviously, that was a big, a big issue across the board. Every business was impacted. Um, but going into it, we kind of took an assessment of each and every industry that we work with and within senior care, within residential assisted living facilities and assisted living facilities in general, we recognized that there, it's a needs-based industry. Um, it's something that people need. It's not something that people can forgo um, and skip. It's not um, an, a, an something that um, like the entertainment industry where um, that took a big hit during COVID. This is something that um, people aren't going to forgo in any way, shape or form. So. There was a bit of a hit, um, especially in a lot of the larger institutional facilities um, that you heard about in the news that got kind of a black eye. Um, but we have seen a lot of them them come back, even if they they were impacted by COVID. A lot of the um, the occupancy rates are, are coming back to normal again. Um, but also with that, with some of the the bad publicity out there, we've seen that smaller facilities have become more popular. Um, people don't want to go to the, the institutional facilities that, again, did have some of that bad press and um, more of the residential, the smaller facilities have um, started to um, take advantage of that in the, in the post-COVID era. Um, so that's what we're seeing out there today. So Live Oak, we are a government guaranteed lender. Um, that being said, there's a few products that we use in that sector. Um, the SBA is the vast majority of that. So within the SBA, there's two SBA loan programs. You have the SBA 7A loan program, the SBA 504 program, and also out there, it's a lesser known product. Um, you have the USDA is a government um, guaranteed loan product and they have a B in it, what they call a BNI loan or a business and infrastructure loan. Um, we work across all spectrums, but again, the vast majority of what we do is SBA and um, within the SBA, the 7A is the most popular product. Um, and reason being is it's, it's the most flexible, as you can see here, it kind of gives you flexibility um, to include working capital um, to do ff &E and leasehold type opportunities with, with 504 and USDA, they are a little more rigid in that they are dependent on collateral and collateral values. Um, so that kind of limits what they're, they're able to be used for and how, um, how you can kind of leverage those products. So here's a quick grid on kind of high level overviews of each of the products. You can see uh, top level there across all different uh, products they're good for you can use either assisted living assisted living or memory care um, independent living actually is not eligible um, in in 7a or usda so if there's an independent living component of any project that um, makes it ineligible for these programs um, but across all of them you have assisted living and memory care is eligible um, project size 7a um, at Live Oak, we can get comfortable up to, to 12 million. The SBA loan program, the 7A loan program actually though only goes up to, um, to 5 million. I'll touch a little bit more on that later, um, but it's the smallest of the bunch. And then you have the 504 and BNI programs that can get a little bit larger. In terms of leverage or kind of loan to cost amount or what you're gonna have to bring down. Again, you can see here the 7A program is a little more flexible, giving you a potential of 90% leverage or a 90% loan to cost where you'd only be required to bring in 10% of the project cost. Um, the 504 program, it's got two numbers there because 504 is broken out with two separate loans that are used to come together to, to create the product. So you have a, um, well, actually I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, this is more um, for different project types. So um, in a construction project, they're gonna require 80%. So you need to come up with 20% uh, down or in an acquisition or a refi, um, they'll do up to 85% um, 85 leverage. And USDA BNI, the, they'll get to, uh, to 80%. Um, term and amortization, um, SBA is fixed there at 25 years. You can see the USDA program can go a little bit longer to 30. 
Um, pricing wise, um, you can do either fixed or floating on the 7A program. Um, 504, this is what I was alluding to a little bit earlier. There's two components to it. There's the bank loan. So the Live Oak bank loan or whichever bank you're working with that's utilizing this program will provide the first loan for 50% of the value of the, the property. And then the SBA loan um, will come in and that will provide a, the, um, or that will be provided by a CDC or certified development company on behalf of the SBA. Um, that's gonna be a smaller percentage, potentially um, anywhere from 30 to 35%. Um, and that one is going to be fixed. Um, and then on the USDA side, you, again, same as 7A, you're gonna be floating or fixed. In terms of prepayment penalties, um, the SBA 7A is again, most flexible here at, at three years. Um, on the 504 program, the, the SBA loan portion of it's gonna be 10 years, but the bank loan side is gonna be variable. So that can differ from, from bank to bank based on um, their kind of risk, risk levels. And then USDA, again, that's gonna be variable depending on different components of the project. Um, that can, that can be um, either longer or shorter, depending on um, certain variables. Um, in terms of what type of businesses are eligible. So across the spectrum here, you can see the business has to be a for-profit business. Um, you can have a nonprofit entity as, as a borrower. Um, and then for the SBA loans, um, all markets and all markets is all 50 states and US territories um, has to be, it's obviously a US government loan back program. So it has to be um, within the US or US territories. And then USDA, BNI, um, that is only for what is what they deem as non-urban markets. So USDA um, has a, a map that they produce online that tells you kind of what the eligible areas are that are more rural that uh, qualify for that product. So parameters from the banking perspective. So outside of kind of what the actual um, product parameters are, this is what the bank gets into in terms of analyzing the project and seeing if it's something that they wanna do. And the easy way to remember this, um, we like to call it the five C's of, of, of lending. First, or as you can see, you've got cash flow, character, capital, credit, and collateral. So first things first, cash flow. Cash flow is gonna be important across the board, but the beauty of the SBA loan program is it allows lenders to be, especially more so in the 7A product, it allows lenders to be cash flow based lenders rather than collateral based lenders. The collateral value is not going to be the driving force in the decision making, but they can rely on the cash flow of the business. And what they're going to want to do is run a quick analysis and make sure that the business is generating enough cash flow to cover the debt associated with the purchase price. In addition to that, um, if you need, depending on kind of the, the structure of the project, if you're going to be in here full time, um, leaving your existing employment or wherever your existing source of income is to be working in this business. Um, again, they need to make sure that the cash flow can not only support the debt, but support your cost of living or your salary because your personal debt obligations aren't going anywhere. And then thirdly, they want to make sure that there's some sort of cash flow cushion there um, because inevitably something's going to go bump in the night. There's going to be some unforeseen obstacle or hurdle that pops up that you didn't, couldn't have planned for. COVID this last year is a great example. Um, every, every business was impacted and nobody really saw it coming. Um, so having that, that cash flow cushion allows you to kind of build up your coffers over the years and be a little bit more prepared um, to take a blow if there is any sort of um, unforeseen obstacle. Um, so as long as the cash flow can meet those three requirements, um, you, you're in the good shape with uh, with the 7A loan program. So you've got being able to cover the debt associated with the project cost, being able to make sure you can pay yourself a salary, and then thirdly, having that, that cash flow cushion left over. Um, and next you have character. So character is a little more ambiguous, um, but bottom line is it, it this is at Live Oak, we view this not as a transaction, but more of a, a partnership and a, a long-term relationship. Um, we wanna make sure that you're someone that we wanna be in business with. Um, as our CEO says, do you have the eye of the tiger? Do you have that, that it factor, whatever you wanna call it, um, that innate drive that's going to um, compel you to be successful? Do you, um, or, or are you going to be the person who at the first sign of, of trouble is going to throw in the towel? And that's really not where uh, we want to go. So we want to make sure that you have that, that character, that it factor, that um, you're someone that we want to 
create a long-term partnership with. Cause again, these loans are, are 25 years um, on the 7A side. So um, it's a long-term relationship and we want to make sure we, we understand that we're um, in the, in the project with someone who, who has that desire to be successful. Um, next is capital. So in other words, cash, um, there are requirements that you have to meet for the SBA loan programs um, in terms of minimum cash payment um, to the project. But really here, it's all about making sure that, that interests are aligned. Um, the bank's gonna be putting up the majority of the capital for the project, but we want you to have some skin in the game as well. We wanna make sure that at the first sign of trouble, again, it's not something that, okay, this is tough. I'm just gonna walk away and turn the keys back over to the bank. We don't want that to happen. We want this to be a successful partnership and aligning interests to, uh, to make sure that that, um, that happens is kind of where this, these capital requirements come in. Um, the next is credit. Um, credit again is, this is gonna be your, your FICO score. We wanna make sure that you've got solid credit and the best way to predict future performance is to look at, look at past performance. Um, and your FICO score is basically your, your financial report card to banks as to how you've handled debt in the past. Um, have you made on-time payments? Have you paid um, obligations as agreed? And if you haven't done that in the past, then that's probably an indicator that um, it's not going to all of a sudden flip a switch and it's going to be um, super clean going forward. So banks use credit as kind of a, an indicator as to how they believe um, future performance is going to go. So that, that's really your report card. And if you're, it's easy to access credit scores today. A lot of credit cards um, offer them for free. Um, your bank's relationships oftentimes now can, excuse me, provide those for free. Um, so, so stay on top of your credit make sure um, I'd say aim for at least a, a 650 or higher. Anything in the 700s is, is good. So make sure you're on top of that and aware of that because all banks are going to be looking into that. And then lastly, the, the fifth C here is collateral. Um, again, this is less important on the SBA 7A side because um, it's not going to be a decision driver. Um, it can come into play, though, if a loan is not fully collateralized. Um, we do have to, to meet SBA regulations. We have to look at additional collateral. Um, and that usually comes to play with other real estate properties that people own. Um, if there's 25% equity, um, the bank is required to file a secondary lien. Um, but collateral on other products like the 504 side is going to be the decision driver. Um, or it's going to kind of dictate what the bank can lend in a project. So um, the value of that property based on an appraisal um, is going to dictate kind of what banks will lend. So uh, again, collateral is kind of a, a key, key component there. Um, again, looking at different um, types of projects in terms of parameters. So uh, first starting from the top here, you've got startups. Startups going to be kind of the most risky for a bank um, because you don't have any, any historical performance to rely upon. Um, you, there's no cash flow being generated on day one. You're going to have to start um, in the red. You're not going to reach break even for a little bit of, little bit of time. So with that, the, the parameters are a little more stringent. Um, we like to see a minimum of 20% equity into the project. And we like to see a little bit of post-injection liquidity. So post-injection liquidity, meaning after you put your down payment in the project, you still have some, some cash reserves uh, to rely upon um, as you're getting through kind of that, that ramp up period. Or if that takes longer, you have some additional liquidity to kind of help support the project. Um, Another thing that's not really on here is oftentimes we do like to see kind of some outside source of, of income to help support the project as it gets up and running. Um, and in startups, that's not a, a, a hard, fast requirement, but it's a definite plus if you have some sort of side income uh, associated with the project. Acquisitions here, obviously, again, you have not as much risk to the bank because you have an existing business. Um, there's a little bit of transition risk, but it, there's proven history here. Um, so potentially anywhere from, from 10 to 15% down payment or 10 to 15% equity for a stabilized asset. Um, right now, due to kind of COVID, um, the COVID landscape, we're not really interested in value add projects or turnaround projects. Um, if you're looking at a facility that's kind of struggled and has maybe 
say it's a six bed facility and they've got two residents currently and it's going to be up to you to kind of come in there and and turn it around and fill those beds and and get this thing to to a profitable a profitable standpoint or or a break even point that's really not something that we're we're interested in uh in doing right now um again we like to to be able to put people especially in this environment to put people in a situation where they're going to be able to to cover their debt from day one and then that that additional profitability that they're able to generate is their sweat equity um, and that's basically their profit that they're able to, to earn for themselves. On expansion projects, if they're structured right, um, you can go to, to higher leverage with the SBA. Um, there, the way the rules are written, if you, uh, again, if the structure meets SBA requirements, you could potentially go up to 100% financing. Um, so they, they, with, if you have an existing facility, you're looking to purchase another one, um, and the numbers make sense. We can we can look at options where you can go as high as 100% financing. Typically, we will again to kind of align interest, have you put a little bit something into the project. But again, that's going to depend on the uh, overall uh, kind of the all-encompassing factors in the project. Uh, one question we get a lot is in regards to remote ownership. That's something that there's two two factors here. Um, first of all, Live Oak, we want to be in a, in, a, in, a, a, um, in a partnership with someone who's an owner operator, who's involved in the business, who's, who's there, invest in the, in, the, um, in the project. But also we have to balance that. Um, we understand sometimes people aren't going to be full day to day, but they're going to be active in managing it and we can work with that. But what we do need to steer clear from is passive investors. And that's the second part. It is actually um, not eligible for SBA borrowers uh, or to finance what the SBA deems a, a passive investment. Um, so we have to prove that our borrower um, is going to have an active role um, in the operations of the business. Otherwise, it's not going to be an, an SBA eligible project. And that's kind of what the second bullet there alludes to is that you have to have an active role in the management of the facility. Um, that's not only live oak, but that's, a, that's an SBA across the board um, rule for any SBA lender out there. Um, and, and geographic location does matter. If you're looking, if you're say in New Jersey and looking to buy a property in Arizona and manage it from there, that's really not something that we're interested in doing. But um, if there's a lesser of a geographical difference and you're able to show that you can um, manage the facility adequately and be involved, um, we can potentially um, look at it there. But obviously being in the same town right there um, is going to be the, the preferred, preferred project. So a little bit about loan mechanics. Um, hot zone here really is saying that any, anything under 7 million is, is what Live Oak likes to do. Um, most SBA lenders are going to cap it at about $5 million because, again, the SBA, I'll touch on a little bit later here, the SBA caps their guarantee at, at $5 million. So for Live Oak, we're willing to go a little bit above that, but at anything under $7 million um, is something that we typically like. Um, we're a little warmer. Um, we'll, we'll do projects up to about $10 million, but again, we really have to have the right parameters and structure in place in order to get comfortable there and kind of reason for a lot of that is on a 7a loan the sba is going to guarantee 75 percent of that loan and it only goes up to five million dollars per guarantor so again here keep continuing down the slide an example a five million dollar sba loan is going to be 75 percent guaranteed by the sba so 3.75 million of that is going to be guaranteed and then 1.25 million is unguaranteed so uncollateralized risk for for the bank and then anything above and beyond that, that um, $5 million is going to be supplemented by a conventional loan. And that's, again, straight um, unguaranteed um, risk to the bank. So that's why, again, we start capping out a little bit around, around $7 million there. So for SBA eligibility, um, I touched on this already. You have to prove that you're going to be actively involved in managing the business um, in certain instances a third party operator can be involved to manage the business. Um, you do have to have an operating agreement with a couple um, bullet points in there or a couple um, items that, that show that there's 
um, going to be active management. Um, and we can kind of help you with that to, to um, make sure it's SBA eligible. Um, anyone, if there's partners in a business, anyone who has 20% or more ownership of that uh, borrowing entity is going to be required to guarantee the loan. So there's someone who has 20% or more and, and won't guarantee the loan that uh, makes it SBA ineligible. Um, again, you've got to have good credit scores. Typically with the SBA, you let, they see minimums, um, or I guess banks have a little bit of leeway with this, but typically we'd like to see again above um, 650, anything in the 700s, typically you're good. Um, a live oak requirement actually is that we draw a hard line in the sand on, on historical bankruptcies. Um, so if there's any bankruptcies, even if they're beyond 10 years, um, that's typically a non-starter for us, um, but that is not an, an SBA requirement. So there are banks out there who can potentially get comfortable with, with bankruptcies, historical bankruptcies. Um, there are certain background checks with the SBA. You need to be, um, we need to make sure that there's not any um, significant criminal history. Um, and if there is um, any sort of, of past criminal charges, we need to get those cleared with the SBA. Um, as it is a government guaranteed product, you have to be a, a U.S. citizen or a legal um, permanent resident. And then finally, the SBA does stand for Small Business um, Administration. So you have to prove that it is a small business. Typically in residential assisted living facilities, there's not any, any issue in qualifying there. And then finally, on any refinance loan, um, cash out loans are not eligible. There is not any um, ability to, to get cash back out uh, of a project. <clears throat> so what do you need for a term sheet? Um, basically, we're going to want to see your business plan. We want to understand how you plan to run this business, how you're going to operate it, why you think this is a good opportunity. Um, and then if it is a, an acquisition, we do want to see the historical tax returns of the seller. We want to understand the financials. We'd like to see a year to date profit and loss statement and a balance sheet. Um, again, for us to do our, our cash flow calculations and make sure that it's um, a project that, that we think is viable from a cash flow perspective. Excuse me. And then finally, regardless of whether it's a, a startup or an acquisition, um, we want to see your projections. Um, we want to see what you believe this business is going to do and understand your underlying assumptions as to, to why that is and, and how you're going to get there. Um, in terms of borrowing entity, we need to see the, the ownership structure. Um, and we'd like to see if it's an acquisition, kind of a letter of intent um, to see where in the process it is and understand the, the exact terms of the agreement. And then in terms of the guarantors, the borrowers, we like to see, we'd like to see three years of personal tax returns. I apologize for that typo in there. Um, and we need to see a personal financial statement, um, again, to make sure that you have the, the capital required um, to meet the, the minimum thresholds uh, for the project. And we'd like to see a, a resume to understand your background, um, any, any business ownership or any operational history that's kind of relevant to the project itself. Um, and then finally, the SBA does require that we take what they call a global look um, at, at the, the borrower and the, the guarantors. So by global, we need to take a look at any other businesses that you own. Um, we need to get the tax returns of anything that you have a controlling ownership in, whether it's greater than 50% or if you are, if there's a lot of investors um, or partners in the project and you are um, controlling in your title, say you're the, the president or the CEO, um, we need to take a look at those entities as well. Um, we need to be able to pull your credit and then get a couple other SBA forms. Um, one of them here obviously is the, the SBA form 1919 and that's basically looking at kind of the, the criminal background um, questions and, and um, making sure you a citizen to qualify for, uh, or, or a legal permanent resident um, to qualify for the SBA loan. Um, any startup project that we do, um, we do require a feasibility study um, and that does need to be bank ordered. Um, it's again, there's, there's banking regulations there, but also we need to um, make sure that there's not um, kind of any influence in that feasibility study being done. In order to get that ordered, we need to have a, a, an address um, or know the property um, to be able to, to get that study ordered and, and performed. Uh, in terms of timing, so one of the issues, especially in the, the RAL space, um, 
is timing of these loans. And it is a business loan and those do take a lot longer than, than residential loans. Um, on average, you can ballpark 60 to 90 days from the time the process gets started to closing um, and breaking that down really. So once we get a full, full loan package, so a lot of the information that was listed on the previous slides, um, once that comes into me, I can go ahead and analyze it. If it looks like a project that we're willing to do, I can issue a proposal that typically takes, I'd say about one week, um, cause there's going to be some, some back and forth and questions there, making sure I understand the project. Um, but once you get that proposal, sign it, send it back. We then start the formal underwriting process. Underwriting typically takes two to three weeks on average. After underwriting is when you hear that you've been formally approved. And then we go into the closing process, closing generally five weeks, um, anywhere 30 to 45 days or so. And then when you um, kind of combine all that together, you're getting to that, that 60 to 90 day time frame. Um, and in this, in this space, typically we'll, we'll try to inform customers that ahead of time. And if they're working with a seller who wants um, kind of a quicker or is expecting a quicker close, we encourage people to kind of negotiate more on the, the timing aspect of getting the, the deal closed rather than say the price, assuming the price is a, uh, a feasible um, price that will come in um, at an appraisal. Another question we get a lot is rate. Um, it's hard to really give people uh, an idea of rate because they're, they're constantly changing, but it also does um, depend on a few factors. Um, we have to look at a bunch of things in, in, um, in all to make sure that everything comes together to get that final rate. But we look at personal credit, we look at the leverage or what you're bringing um, into the project in terms of the down payment, um, what the actual market is in terms of potential feasibility study, how um, feasible that, that market is, what the overall deal size is, the facility type and the cash flow. So all that stuff really comes together. But I can say right now today, um, vast majority of loans for the SBA product are variable rates and they're coming in, I'd say somewhere I'd anticipate kind of mid to low five range again, plus or minus there, depending on all these factors. So um, don't hold me to that. Again, I'm just trying to give you some sort of ballpark idea here, but that's where a lot of um, SBA 7A loans are, are being priced today. So at Live Oak, again, I talked about a lot of this already, but what, what really makes us different is that we have a group of people who are fully dedicated to, um, to the senior care industry. Uh, that's all we do. Um, and, and if you come to us with, say, a, a convenience store deal or a hotel deal or anything that it's, hey, it's something we tell you, either we can refer it to another one of our groups that might work on it, or it's something that our bank doesn't really do. So we have um, a team that works within the industry um, and we have an understanding you don't have to explain the business model to us. Um, we already understand that. Um, we are an SBA preferred lender and what that means is that gives us the ability to approve loans in-house without having the SBA take a look at anything. Um, they, once we make a decision, once you get that credit approval, um, it's simultaneously approved by the SBA um, without having to take any additional steps. The other side of that is if you're working with a bank that does not have that, they have to process um, through the what they call the, the GP process or general processing route. And what they do is once they make a loan decision in-house, they have to then package it up, send it off to the SBA and the SBA reviews it and either confirms or denies that decision. And again, that can take weeks to, to months to add on to the process, depending on how backed up the SBA is. Um, we've got a construction department um, in-house here, so we don't um, use a third party for that, which helps kind of um, cut down on the, the communication and expedites that process. Um, another unique thing is that we don't require any depository relationships. So if you have a, a business today and, and you're happy with your deposit accounts at another bank, um, you can get a loan with Live Oak and we don't require you to, to move those at all. Um, and we're also very big on transparency. Um, I was speaking to someone in the breakout and they mentioned that they had, uh, they weren't able to get an SBA loan and they didn't know why. And um, I had told them, I mean, our goal, whether we get to a yes or whether we get to a no, we want you to know exactly why that is, whether it's something in your personal background that, that got to a no or whether it was the business cash flow that didn't get there. 
um, but we really like you. And if we find another project for you, um, we'll be happy to do it. So regardless of what answer we get to, we like to be transparent throughout the entire process. So you know exactly um, where you stand and, and why we got to the result we did. Um, again, we're flexible on structure. Um, we have different products we can use um, across the, the government guaranteed um, spectrum and, and are able to tailor kind of a product that's, that's best for your situation. And again, I mentioned earlier on that we are actually the um, largest SBA lender in the country by, by dollar volume. So is the SBA something that's right for you and right for your project? Um, we've got a couple questions here that uh, kind of make you think about that. Um, and really it boils down to a couple of these first two. Do you um, have the equity required? Do you have a lot of cash to be able to put towards a project to meet the minimum requirements of a conventional loan? Um, or do you have the, the working capital um, available to kind of cover the operating deficit or the operating costs um, if you just get the real estate financed by itself? Um, do you need kind of the flexibility of a long-term loan, a longer amortization without any balloon? Um, and is kind of expansion something that's going to, with minimal cash, going to allow you to, uh, to meet your goals? So really, if any of those, if you can answer any of those questions um, or think about these questions um, and the SBA parameters really make sense, then I think uh, SBA is, is the path to go. And with it, that's, that's my presentation. Um, I should, have, I should have had my contact information here, but I believe that is in the chat. So um, hopefully you can save that and reach out if you have any questions. But I think with that, Vern, we'll uh, open it up to questions. Any yeah, question? I have a question. Go ahead. Adam? Uh, a question. Uh, in the SBA loan, uh, would, would you... CJ, would you guys accept a gift of equity for the down payment or they need to have their own money? Um, gift can work. We do have to have a gift letter associated with that. Um, so we do like to have someone put um, capital into the project of their own so that way we know they're, they're invested. Um, again, it doesn't have to be the full amount, but uh, uh, gift letters are acceptable. We work with them all the time, but we do have to have the, the gift letter asso associated with it. There can't be any um, expectation of, of repayment on that, that gift. I see, I see, I see. All okay, right. I, I have questions. Hello, right. Trey? Yes, uh, you made mention of uh, the closing um, period to be, I uh, said, 60 to 90 days. Mm -hmm. Does it include the construction period? Let's say if you're doing a new construction, which I believe you guys do as well, right? Uh, does it, the 90 days, is it included in that? No, so, can, well, the construction portion of the loan is all included in that. So the construction loan is approved in that, but the actual construction phase itself usually takes, depending on the project, anywhere from six months to a year to 18 months. So that construction phase comes after the loan closes and it's not included within that 60 to 90 days. Does that okay. answer your question? Yes, which means the construction comes before the closing period. No, so the, the construction actually comes after the closing. So we'll close on a loan and then you'll wor work with one of our construction officers to disperse that loan throughout the construction process. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. We have a question in the chat from Francis <laughs> and that is, what is your approach with the SBA when representing first time group home owners slash operators? I was declined due to not having industry relevant experience, even though I had very experienced consultants listed in my business plan. <clears throat> yeah, and that's something that we understand. I mean, if we required ownership or operating experience on every deal, there wouldn't be many, um, many people out there in the, in the industry with a loan. So it's more of understanding, okay, what's your relevant experience? And if you don't have anything, how have you kind of mitigated for that? If you have people who you're working with to consult with, um, or mentors who are involved. Um, we take all that into consideration. We've done projects for, for people who don't necessarily have um, direct industry experience, but have kind of a relevant background um, to the project that, that we deem is, is um, beneficial. Okay, uh, Fran has her hand up. Fran, you have a question? 
Yes. Um, my question is, uh, I, I actually have two, but I'm going to give you one first. Um, like if I, I'm planning to partner up with a partner in Florida and she's a nurse. And so she um, would that work? Um, it depends on kind of in more detail on the project. Um, what, what's her involved? Are you in Florida as well? Or is the project in Florida? Where's the project? What's um, kind of the operational plan? Who's going to be the one kind of day to day involved in, in, in running the, the business? Um, the project is going to, I'm in Denver. Um, mm -hmm. The project is going to be in Florida and she's the one who's going to be um, doing day to day things and administrating it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we can get comfortable with that. I mean, that's something that's, that's viable as long as you have a partner who's um, kind of there on site going to be involved in management. That's, that's a structure that can work. Okay. Okay, friend. Uh, we'll come back to your second question. Charles has his hand up. Charles? Hey, CJ. Uh, I'm actually hey, brand new to this in general. Um, and I don't have, so one of the deals that I'm looking at is around a million dollars and mm -hmm. it's an existing business, but if I go to you for a loan and you guys say, Hey, we'll do 75%. Well, I don't have the capital to put down my percentage. So what do I do in, uh, um, you know, getting that loan, what are my options? So the options for you, if you don't have the capital, um, would be to, to find a way to, to raise the capital if that um, if you're able to get a gift letter, if you're lucky enough to have um, family members or friends who are willing to do that, um, you can raise capital that way, or um, you can bring in investors who have equity within the business. Um, so they're kind of investing and providing those funds, um, but they're also going to be able to to cash out kind of as the business grows and is successful with, with distributions um, throughout the process. So um, you can potentially raise those funds through, through ownership structure or um, whatever kind of means you have um, to get there. But taking out another loan separate from that is not going to work. Correct. Yeah. It does have to be um, cash from you. It can't be borrowed funds. And there is um we do have to trace those funds as to where they came from um, to ensure that they aren't borrowed funds. So if it is a, um, a loan that you take out, that wouldn't make it eligible uh, to cover that down payment. Gotcha, understood, thanks. Yep. Brian, you have another question? Yes, so uh, let's say in a million dollar loan from SBA, what is the cushion amount that you should have? What's the percentage? So it's going to depend. Um, the S, excuse me, the SBA minimum is when they look. Um, I'm going to talk in kind of cash. Flow. I didn't get into this or an example, but um, we look at cash flow coverage ratios. So we want to make sure that there's enough cash flow to cover the debt. So let's just use round figures. So say your annual debt payment is going to be. I'm just making up numbers. hundred thousand dollars. If you owe hundred thousand dollars per year, we want to see that. And, and again, there's some variability here. If it's a, if it's a, um, if it's a property where all the residents are private pay, we can get a little more flexible in our cash flow coverage ratios. So we'd like to see a 1.25 debt service coverage ratio, which means um, that for every, so that hundred thousand dollars in debt, we'd like to see $125,000 in cash flow. So at least 25% more um, cash flow than that debt payment. Um, if there's some, some government payers in there, so if it's a heavy um, government pay facility, again, there's a little more risk there because rates, reimbursement rates might not um, keep up or they, they might, um, you don't have as much control over those if your operational costs increase. Um, so with that, we like to see kind of a one five debt service coverage ratio. So in that scenario, we'd like to see at least a $150,000 in cash flow against $100,000 in an annual debt payment. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yep. Thank you. 
Shalom, did that answer your question? I saw you had your hand up. Okay, I'm assuming that is. I'm sorry, I couldn't unmute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry about that, I'm, this is a little new for me. Um, no, that wasn't quite the question that I had. I wanted to know um, if I were to, was it, were, if I was able to use my retirement funds to fund, you know, my mm. project. Yep, you, you are able to use um, retirement funds. Um, I'm not a, a tax advisor, or CPA, or lawyer, so I'd, I'd, I'd tell you to consult those professionals um, in doing that. There's different ways to do it through um, a 401k ro or a, a ROBS plan, a rollover okay. business startup option. Um, okay. there, there's other different options that you can use there, but yeah, um, using retirement is a, a feasible um, option to, to come up with those funds. One more question. So um, if I do that, I would have to do the ROB the Rob funds through a CPA um, entity, uh, you're, 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 you wouldn't be. There, there's certain legal parameters. Um, you have to have a certain entity type. It has to be a C corporation. Um, and again, I just know enough high level stuff. Um, that's why I say I consult those other professionals to, to structure it properly. Um, but when you do go that route, there are certain per parameters that, that need to be in place to, to make it uh, viable or eligible. Okay, and my last question, just one last question. When structuring this project, there's, there's two facets of the business. There's the real estate part, and then there's the business part, mm -hmm. correct? So when I'm structuring my LLCs, do I do two LLCs, one to take care of the real estate, one to take care of the business side? Or do I just structure it as one LLC and buy the business and the real estate in that? So... Again, I'd advise you to consult with, say, say your attorney or your advisors. Um, we do see, it to, to, for the SBA, it doesn't matter. You can use one entity to purchase it all, or you can do two separate entities. And typically, and what we call that on our side is um, kind of you have a, a real estate holding company and a, an operating company. And we call that an, um, the real estate holding company for the SBA is an eligible passive company. An EPC company is what they call it. And an OC, an operating company, is the business side. Um, in that instance, just both of those businesses or both of those entities would be co-borrowers on the loan. So it's a common structure we see all the time. Um, and it's not an issue. You can go that route. Okay. Is that, do I do that through the lending area or do I have to do that through my CPA during the LLC? Um, you just do that when you create your, your entities, you, um, oh. you create, you, um, whoever your advisor is who's helping you create those entities oh. that you'll create one entity for, um, the real estate and one entity for the operations. Okay. Thank you. Martin, you're up. Very well. I you're um, mute, Martin. Real quick. Um, if we don't have a property, would it kind of help us to do like a pre-approval to get some of the paperwork done? sooner you can and that's where sba is a little bit different because it is, it is multifaceted um just because you get pre-approved doesn't mean that if you come to us with a proper say say based on your liquidity positions just using round numbers again say it will approve you you're eligible to get a loan for up to for a million dollars now if you turn around and come back to us with a property that's being sold for a million dollars that doesn't that pre-approval, we call it pre-qualification, doesn't guarantee that it's gonna be approved because then we have to do, again, the business analysis. If the million dollar property doesn't cash flow, essentially a million dollars in debt or call it, say it's a 90% leverage loan, it can't cash flow $900,000 in debt, we're not gonna approve that. We don't wanna put you in a position, again, where you have to improve the business to, to, to be successful or to service the debt. So, um, just making sure that you're kind of, I hate the term pre, pre-approved. Again, it's more pre-qualified to obtain an SBA loan, um, but it is, there's a dual analysis there. It's, we can approve you say, okay, yes, you're eligible for an SBA loan. Um, but again, we do have to run the full analysis on the, the business or the property. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I just want to piggyback on that. Um, so say when we want to go and see a property, they will say, oh, we want a letter 
saying or the pre-qualified letter or pre-approved letter saying that you mm. are qualified, you cannot see it. Um, uh, so I don't know where do we stand in this. And that's why I say we, we will do those pre-qualification letters because we understand there's oftentimes sellers want to know that you're able to, to get a loan. Um, so that's why I say personally, we, we can run through that process to get that done. So that way you have a pre-qualification letter um, to kind of open up some doors. But again, that doesn't guarantee that, that the loan will be approved because um, we, again, need to make sure that the business is operating at a level that's um, sufficient to support the debt. Jeff. Uh, yeah, two questions following up. Uh, CJ on on that pre qualification, what is the approximate cost to to get that accomplished? Time. There's no monetary cost to it. It's just the time it takes to get the forms to us. Okay, thank you. And, and with regard to the equity requirement, uh, how does the seller note fold into to that uh, meeting that requirement? How do y'all look at that? Okay, great question. So with the SBA, um, again the on a 7A side, the minimum down payment is, is 10%. Now, there is a rule where the seller can contribute some equity to the project, um, but it, it has to be in the form of a standby note, and it can't be for more than 5% of the project cost. So in reality, the, if the seller is willing to agree to it, which in this space we've seen is pretty rare, um, you can come up with 5% of the down payment, and the seller can basically contribute that other 5%. But the way they do that is they hold a seller note that is on standby for the life of the loan. So standby means that they can't receive any payments of principal or interest while the SBA loan is, is outstanding. Um, interest can accrue to say, again, let's use a million dollar example. 10% is going to be a hundred thousand. You bring 50,000. The seller holds a note for 50,000. They can't get paid on that 50,000 until the SBA loan is gone. And in these instances, they're 25 year terms. So they can't get anything until at least, until as the, the paperwork is written until 25 years down the road, unless you prepay the note or pay it out sooner. But that 50,000 can grow to, depending on the interest rate, a significant amount over that 25 year term. So if they wanna get paid off in the near term, you've got to refi. Correct. If you count it towards equity, we can have a seller note. Oftentimes we like to have a seller note in the project, um, but you still have to come up with that 10% minimum. Um, say again, just to using the million dollar example, you come up with a hundred thousand dollars to cover the SBA requirement. We can still have the seller hold another hundred thousand dollar note. So that way the bank's only financing 80% of the project. Um, and that hundred thousand dollar note can start to be paid on day one. But that's as because you um, met the SBA minimum 10% down payment on your own. You didn't need that to be counted towards equity. Yeah. If you want to pay them off earlier, can you can you get a revaluation? Um, your obviously valuation is going up as time goes, but no, unfortunately not, not with the SBA. Okay. Well, good to know. Thanks. Dioma. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, this will be Eric, not Sioma. That's okay. Um, I'll start the video. Sorry. Ah, there we go. Um, so, what are the options if you know if we have an existing home right now, but want to get like an SBA and a construction loan? Um, because it sounds like we have to do all three through Live Oak. Yeah, um, great question. So if you own the property today, um, it's tough for a bank to get involved in providing, say, the working capital for the startup and the construction component of it um, being in a second on the property. Unless you own the property free and clear, that makes it a little bit easier. Um, but assuming you have a mortgage on it, we would require, we would basically need to be able to refinance that existing note so that way we have. Um, the first lien on the property and then provide the cost of the construction and the working capital for the business to get that going. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Brand, did you have another question? Sorry. 
So how many years of experience do you guys look at? What specific area? Like I have a master's degree in accounting and also I have some experience here and there, like, you know, and I own a little assisted living home too. So in order to get that loan, how many years of experience do you look at? There isn't a, a set requirement there. Um, you don't have to have operational experience. It's more of having what we deem is kind of the, the background and the operational plan um, to be able to execute. It, it's, there isn't a minimum ownership experience. Um, we've, I've financed, um, I've gotten people approved who, who don't have any ownership experience, but they were, um, they're physical therapists and, and had a great business plan um, to be able to oper run and operate a business. So uh, those opportunities are, are uh, things we can do. Okay. Pamela? I think you're on mute, Pamela. Get it up there, okay. I always forget which one to click. Um, I was wondering, is, is there any penalty for paying off the loan early? There is, um, and it varies by product. Um, again, focusing on the 7A side, there is a three, three year prepayment penalty with the SBA 7A loan. And it's, if you pay more than, if you pay it off in the first year, it's a 5% penalty. In year two, it's a 3% penalty. In year three, it's a 1%, so 531 in the first three years. After three years, there's no prepay. Okay, and was that also just a three-year loan though? What? No, it's a 25-year loan. Okay. Okay, any other questions out there? Well, that was a good round of questions. I think we all learned a lot from that. CJ, thanks so much. You're, you're full of knowledge on this and uh, I'm sure that you have your contact information in the chat so that everybody can reach out to CJ. Again, Live Oak's been great to work with and I highly recommend them. Thank you, Vern. I appreciate you putting this on. Um, I believe I got my contact information in the chat. So um, if anyone has any questions, uh, my, my cell phone number's in there and my email's there. So don't hesitate to call, email, um, whatever. I'm happy to answer any questions and, and work with you on, a, on any project you have. All right. Let's give CJ a round of applause. Actually, I don't uh, see you. information there. I don't see a phone number information in there. So maybe um, I'm... I put it in there. It's at 931 if you look at the timestamps. Okay. Which is probably 731. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 731 for y'all. Depending on what time zone you're in. All right. So we've got to the point in our meeting where we have haves and wants, and this is an opportunity for anybody that has something or uh, wants to say anything to the group, you can certainly do it. If you have a service you want to tell the group about, you can certainly uh, do that. Do we have anybody that has haves or wants that they would like to share with the group? Uh, actually, Vern, hi, this is Sioma now. <laughs> hi, Sioma. Hi. So I, I do actually um, kind of to piggyback on what Eric was asking CJ um, in our situation. I didn't know if there was anybody out there that can give us um, a little bit of advice. If, if what he's suggesting that we have to refinance, if that's not going to work and we still need to get, we still need to find a construction loan um, or a business loan, what are our other options if CJ's route would not work? So I'm just wondering if there's someone that can give us a little bit of info or, or advice on that. Hmm. Well, I, you know, the first thing I'd say would be maybe a, a home equity line of credit might be something I, I don't know if you're in your situation because I'm familiar with your deal, if right. that would work. And there's a first and second in place in your situation. So that makes it a little bit more challenging as well. Right. Um, you know, in, in the, in business, there's always two ways to get money. Mm -hmm. One is debt and one is equity. So uh, debt is pretty obvious where you go into debt. The other way is equity, where you take on a partner and give them a, a piece of the business. So that's right. an option, not maybe not the one you want, but that's an option. Okay. Um, if you had another piece of property, 
maybe collateralizing something like that might be uh, possible. Or one of our rent, our rental. Uh huh. If you have a rental and you could, you know, do a second or um, or refi it with some cash out. Uh, th those are some possibilities. Okay. Um, or, well, hmm, you know, maybe even a, a, a hard money loan with, uh, if you know, if there's enough equity in it and if somebody would do a hard money in a second position, that's challenging, but, you know, we're, we're grasping at straws. Right. Okay. Okay. That's kind of what I, I just kind of wanted to get in that frame of thought and, and think of the other things that we can do in that situation. So. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else, any haps, wants, questions for the group? Shalom. Okay, sorry. I You may have already said this, but it's a 10% minimum to bring in for SBA loan qualification or to qualify for it. And what else? Is there any other requirements besides a 10% down? Yes, yeah, so 10% is the, the true minimum. Um, oftentimes, though, in these types of projects, just full transparency, full disclosure, we typically see 15, closer to 15%. Um, but if the business is um, operating efficiently, 10% could be um, feasible. Um, but that is the SBA minimum. In terms of um, other requirements, it's ha if it's a startup project, having a feasibility study, um, Obviously, good credit is another one. Um, What's the credit score for that? We'd like to see in the 700s. Um, true minimum is 650. I mean, we understand people are human. Stuff happens. Um, if it's a, if it's in the upper 600s, um, we can kind of talk about it. Get the get the story of, of what went, what what the reason is for that, um, and get comfortable with it. Um, but typically, mm -hmm. if you're in the 700s, it's good. Um, no historical hurt. bankruptcies. I just, I just purchased one and I'm in probably like three months in right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was completely, I'm, I'm buying it from a friend of mine. Um, and the, it was opera, you know, they've had it for five years, but, um, they don't have any clients now because they closed it down for a few months to sell the property. And so I'm coming in now to, and I've purchased it, um, with my own cash and I'm now trying to, to, um, or, you know, at least purchase the business side of it, not the real estate side. And I have two clients so far in the property, but what do I do? I need to, how many more clients do I need to have? I'm licensed for eight and they want 302 for the property. I mean, I don't really know how do I, how much, what do I need to have five or six people in there before I start applying for the loan or just well, I, I guess I'm a bit confused. So you bought the property already, but not the business? Well, I bought the business, not the property. So I'm trying to fund the real estate part of it. But I'm, I bought the business okay. area. You know what I mean? I'm running the business part of it, but I'm trying to fund the, the, the real estate part because I want to buy I have an answer out. for you. I've, I've been okay. running homes for 18 years and um, I have several that are licensed for eight. With all your fixed expenses, like your staffing and your overhead, pretty much your break even is about four, four to five residents. And then the additional three is where the profit is. Okay. So that can give you, you, you got to have four in there to break even it, unless you're working the shifts yourself. But if you're hiring yeah, right staff, now, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, if you're hiring staff out, that's your hugest, uh, that's your largest fixed expense is your staffing. My staff. I'm so no, once I'm you start hiring staff, yeah. Okay. Once you start hiring staff, you got to have four, at least four clients in there, probably paying private pay. That's not a Medicaid rate that's going to break even on you. Um, it, that's at 4000 a month, probably a break even someplace in there. And then, then the other four are going to be where you're making your money. I, I was okay. going to jump in, Janet, and, and say mm -hmm. we have a lot of people across the country and private pay rates vary quite a bit. So where, where are you at, Shalom? I'm in, I'm in Arizona. And okay, my so in the area that I'm in, my private pay is probably going to be my singles are going for thirty. I mean, three thousand, and private is going for thirty five hundred. That's the way I have it priced. I am I am licensed for Medicaid too, so I have I'm a Medicaid house also. Right. So, so you're going to need like five privates at least to, 
to be at a break even on that. That's true. And here in Colorado, uh, you know, we're they say now <laughs> that the average is almost five thousand, uh, is what Genworth is saying for two thousand twenty one. And that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, we're we're seeing some people in the six range and some in the four range. So, you know, that five is certainly reasonable. Pulling, I've been put, doing so many tours, and I'm telling you, so it seems like it is pulling teeth to get three. When I say three, it seems like they're freaking out on me. But I, I mean, I'm still going for it. Yeah, you know, I think uh, once you get a reputation for giving good good service. Um, but when you're starting out, that's that is a challenge. You know, they don't know you from Adam. <laughs> that's Adam. so true. <laughs> wow, it's challenging, but I'm not giving up. I love it. I like the reward. The reward of filling of the clients' families telling me how they are watching me take care of their their um, loved one is just the most extraordinary feeling of it all. That's great. That, that's, well, that's thank you guys for the information i really really appreciate this you bet anybody else have any other season where comments they want to share with the group or questions I have, or i have know, one question for cj go ahead olivia um cj for the 10 percent down if you have an investor who comes with that 10 percent is that okay or does it need to be a 10% from me per se? You can have an investor, um, but it all depends on how it's structured. Um, if the investor has equity in the business, that's fine. Um, but if the investor kind of provides you the money with an expectation of repayment, that makes it ineligible. Um, so it has to be either gifted funds or true equity where that investor um, has kind of an ownership stake in the business or it's gifted. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else? No more happy Hello. Ones? Hello. All right. uh, somebody trying to interject here? Go ahead. This is Adam. I just want to ask CJ one question. What is the fee for the SBA loan? So it's a it's a sliding scale. Um, the SBA guarantee fee is what it's called, and it's it's. It varies based on the loan amount, um, but typically it's about two to three percent of the overall loan. Um, right now, uh, I don't know if it's going to be relevant for many people um, here, but if the um, if the loan closes prior to the end of September this year with the recent CARES Act incentives, um, that loan is entirely waived. Or that's not the loan. The um, the guarantee fee is entirely waived. Um, but I'd say with the current volumes we're facing, the we'd probably have to get the application in within the next, I'd say month or so um, to be able to kind of hit that deadline. Well, thank you, CJ, I appreciate your help. You and Vern, thank you. Thanks, Adam. Good to see you, Adam. Yeah, you too. Okay, we're gonna um, wrap up this part of the meeting. Now, I always leave the session open if you guys want to continue to network amongst yourselves. Uh, we'll leave it open for another half hour or so. So feel free. Um, I'll be signing off and we'll sign off on Facebook. And CJ, if you want to hang out, you're more than welcome to. Um, but uh, at, at this point, we kind of call the meeting a close. And this is where we hang out after the meeting if you want to and just do some networking. If not, if you want to sign off, you're welcome to. Thanks, everybody, for making it tonight. Uh, we're always happy to see a good group like this and have this kind of interaction with everybody. And we hope to see you guys next month, last Wednesday of every month. Uh, I'm not sure what our topic is for next month. Hopefully I'll come up with something good. This will be a tough one to follow though. You did a great job tonight, CJ. Thanks, Fern. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. You bet. Thanks again and everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Hey, I don't know who that lady was who responded to me about my house, but I'd like to talk to her a little more.